under 90 days left until the election and a lot's going on. And we've done research on polling and other models that would suggest there's a, there's a front runner at this time. And uh, we're going to talk through what we've learned. So Mike, welcome. And uh, why don't you take us through sort of the first element of this, which, uh, which are the betting odds for who's going to win the White House? Yeah, the betting odds, um, you know, you don't want to rely too heavily on any one historically reliable indicator of who's going to win the election. So this is just one of the many we're going to talk about. But right now, if you look at the betting odds, um, the the uh, Democrats are very heavily favored to maintain control of the House and over 80 percent probability. And those odds have been increasing since the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, the Democrats are actually now favored to take the Senate as well. That's a little closer race, uh, somewhere around a 60 percent uh, betting odds implied probability. And then Joe Biden is favored to win the presidency with a, a similar odds as the Senate. So something over a 60 percent implied probability. So the betting odds are basically suggesting quite different from what they were saying in February or January. But now they're basically suggesting a Democratic sweep is the most likely outcome. Right. And a lot's obviously changed since February. Um, let's look at the the polling, because a lot of people discount or discredit polling because it's sort of a snapshot in time, uh, but the polls are sort of in alignment with the betting odds. Yeah, exactly right. Um, the polls, you definitely need to take with a grain of salt. And generally speaking, polling data is more reliable at predicting the popular vote as opposed to the electoral college. So that's where you, know, you need to have a pretty big margin. Um, uh, based on what the polls suggest for them to have any any validity. And what we've seen is Joe Biden is ahead in the polls and his advantage has been growing uh, since the pandemic and the lockdown to the point where now he's, he has about a 9% uh, advantage in the polling average, 9, 10%. So that type of a margin has historically been pretty reliable. And in terms of there's, there's always a lot of weight put on approval rating. And um, I think we found that it's generally less conclusive, but take us through Trump's approval rating. It's definitely been on the decline since the, the virus has hit. Definitely. And, and approval ratings, depending on when you look at them, Trump's approval rating was somewhere near 47% prior to the virus, somewhere around there, 46, 47%, and has dropped pretty significantly uh, to the point where now his approval rating is right around 40%, um, which is definitely on the low side. So if you think about the last six incumbents that were seeking re-election, what was the lowest approval rating uh, any of those incumbents had, and they were actually able to, to win re-election? Um, you know, there's, there's only been one uh, that was able to win re-election with a polling average below 50%. Uh, so that was, that was George W. Bush in 2004. So the, the odds, if you look at approval ratings, are certainly stacked against Donald Trump at this point. Mm -hmm. What's more valid is the approval ratings right before the election. And so you know, going from something like 40% now up to 50% in the next few months, that's what Trump basically has to pull off in order to have better odds of, of securing re-election. And uh, in what, in your opinion, in our opinion, do you think... Um he he's trying to do or can do in order to improve his approval rating going into the the last three months here. Well, the the reasons some of the reasons commonly cited why his approval rating has been falling are the perceived mismanagement of the COVID nineteen crisis, as well as he's attached a lot of his approval rating to the economy, to the labor market, and to the stock market. And you know, two of those three things, the labor market and the economy have definitely taken a turn for the worst since February with the COVID-19 lockdown. So what we need to see, uh, what Trump would need to see to get his approval rating going back up, you know, the stock market is already back near all-time highs, so that looks pretty good. But we would need to see some really, really strong economic data here in the next few months. Um, and we'd need to see uh, really strong jobs data as well. So the incentive is certainly for the Trump administration to, almost regardless of the COVID-19 case counts, continue to reopen the economy and allow states to reopen so the employment picture can get better and the economic picture can get better. And hopefully that can lead to a higher approval rating. Yeah, it seems like the clock is uh, running out on that. Uh, <laughs> 
that potential. So um, in our research, we've uh, we've also looked at a model developed by an individual named Alan Lickman. Uh, maybe you could take us through that model. He's been fairly accurate at predicting elections and um, yeah. and his data we've we've displayed here. So walk us through sort of how he developed his model and, and what we think about it. Yeah, so Alan Lickman developed this model in the early 1980s, uh, looking at um, election data going back to the 1800s, sometime in the 1800s. So using a tremendous amount of data um, and basically how his framework differs from traditional framework and how, uh, how most people tend to think about the election is he thinks about it not as Americans going to the voting booth to decide the future of the country and a path between two different leaders. Um, he views it more as this is simply a referendum on the past four years. He, he developed these keys to the White House, so 13 conditions that if, if you can say they have been met, if the incumbent party can say eight of these 13 keys uh, or eight of these 13 conditions have been met, then the incumbent party has a very high probability of being reelected. Um, if the incumbent party cannot say that, then there will be a change. Um, and it's, it just goes back to Americans don't vote for the future. They just look at the past four years and they say, I just want change. Um, and so, you know, you go through each of these 13 different keys, some of them definitely more objective than others. Uh, but right now, it looks like Donald Trump has somewhere between six or seven keys to the White House. Once again, he would need eight. Um, and eight is, is, you know, right on the borderline. Uh, but this framework has been used to accurately predict uh, just about every election since 1984. The only one where it was wrong was the 2000 election in which um, the framework predicted Al Gore would win. And Al Gore did win the popular vote, but ultimately lost uh, the presidential election. Yeah, so take us through some of these conditions, current conditions, and uh, focus maybe on some of the more subjective ones. Yeah, some of some of the more uh, objective ones. The the first is the incumbent party holds more seats after the midterm elections than it did after the previous midterm, and we know Republicans lost a lot of seats in the 2018 midterm, so the Republicans do not get a point for that. Um, there's no serious contest for the incumbent party nomination. Trump was basically uncontested. Give Trump a point for that. Um, the incumbent party is, a, is the sitting president, uh, so gets a point for that. Uh, there is no significant third party or independent campaign, um, you know, aside well, from well, Kanye West, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. aside from Con Kanye West, uh, maybe he's not significant enough, but you would say Trump would get a point for that. So think about, think about Kim Kardashian as the first lady. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Um, so there, you're somewhere around three out of four. Um, the economy is not in recession during the campaign. Uh, that a big reason why you've seen Trump's approval ratings and the betting odds moving against Trump since March is because we now are in recession. Then you look at long-term economic growth as real GDP per capita during Trump's term uh, equal or exceeded the prior two terms. And that has not been the case, primarily because of this COVID-19 crisis. Um, Long-term economic growth is, is lower now, so no points there. The incumbent administration affects major changes in national policy. I would say Trump does get a point there. You think about sweeping tax reform as, as one big, big point on that side. So he has changed things for sure. Um, there's no sustained social unrest during the term. With the, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, you would say that Trump does not get a point there. The incumbent administration is untainted by major scandal. Uh, President Trump was impeached, so you'd say no points there. The incumbent administration suffers no major failure in foreign or military affairs. Uh, probably get a point there. There haven't been any overly significant or material uh, foreign military conflicts. Um, certainly no kinetic conflicts during the term. Um, the incumbent administration achieves a major success foreign or military affairs. That one you could say is maybe more subjective uh, because the trade deal that the U.S. struck with China, you could say that is a victory, but then you also have to think that the trade war was also started by Trump. So just correcting something you started, we'd probably say no points on that one. Um, 
The incumbent party candidate is charismatic or a national hero. This one is also subjective. Uh, no doubt Trump is not a national hero, but as far as being charismatic, this is debatable. He's certainly viewed as very charismatic to a certain cohort of the population, um, but not viewed that way by other folks. So that one could go either way, uh, but most likely a zero. Um, and then the final part, the challenging party candidate is charismatic or a national hero. So uh, that one also subjective. We would say Joe Biden would not be perceived as being charismatic or a national hero, so Trump would get a point. So you throw all that together, uh, basically what you're looking at is Trump gets six or seven keys, how you look at it right now, um, and he needs eight. So this framework would also suggest a change in political party in November. Right. Yeah, and I think as we stack up the... Uh the data here. This is the theme we're going to see as we move on to the Electoral College and sort of the overwhelming lead that Biden has in Electoral College. Uh, that would also support sort of the notion here that uh, that Biden and the Democrats are going to take the White House. So take us through the Electoral College stats as we see them today. Yeah, all these other metrics we've talked about are more reliable at predicting the popular vote. So it's very important to look at the Electoral College because that's what really matters. And so for this, we lean heavily on the Cook Political Report, which is widely regarded as having the most reliable information in terms of where states are going to ultimately vote, how they're going to ultimately vote. So you need 270 votes for a win. If you look at the different shades of states that are like that are likely or solid or going to lean Democrat. Basically, the Democrats have 279 blue to light blue states. So in order for Biden to win, he wouldn't need any votes from any states leaning them or from the toss up column um, at all. So any of those swing states, he basically doesn't need to win any of those. Um, the Republicans, on the other hand, uh, they have about 188 votes in solid and likely uh, and and lean electoral college votes. So they're pretty far short. So they would need an additional 71 electoral college votes, which would mean they would need to get everything from the toss-up column, plus steal 11 elect electoral college votes from the states that are leaning Democrat. So that's a pretty tall order. Anything can happen, uh, but all these things basically lining up for uh, likely Biden victory and uh, potentially a Democratic sweep. Yeah, it's that uh, that phrase that nobody who's in the lead wants to hear is uh, it's yours to lose. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think let's wrap up and conclude with sort of the the market's predictive power in elections and some interesting facts around what happens leading up to the election in the in stock market. Yeah, also the S&P 500 has shown to be a very reliable predictor of the election outcome. Um, there's, there's sort of correlation versus causation that we can talk about here. But the basic idea is if in the 90 days prior to the election, the S&P 500 has a negative return, it basically predicts that there will be a change in, in party and power. Um, and if it is a positive return, then then the, the incumbent party will be reelected. And so we don't know what the 90 day return running up to the election is. Uh, you're not gonna know that until election night. Um, but the way we view this is you look at all of the polling data, betting data, Lickman data, electoral college data, and it seems very likely that uh, Democrats are, are likely to, to gain control. And so that would influence our outlook for the S&P 500 over the next 90 days, we would expect that the S&P 500 would be flat-ish in a, a very low return environment because the market has to struggle with and consume and digest this new risk, which is a whole new political regime. Mm -hmm. uh, the market just doesn't like change and they don't like risk that they haven't seen before and that's difficult to price. So that would be that would influence our outlook on the S and P 500 for the next 90 days. Is how we would most effectively use this data. Right, and most of these numbers are small, but there are a few outliers here that uh, are a bit alarming, especially the 
the 2008 election. You know, you imagine the S&P 500's 22% downturn in the 90 days before the 2008 election was far more about the global financial crisis than it was about people struggling to price the risk of, of Barack Obama as the president. Um, so you have a few of those outliers, but uh, yeah. generally it's, 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 been, it's been very valid. And, and we're not suggesting that this is a, a certainty and uh, that you should, you should take action now if you think Biden's going to win and, and get out of the stock market. Right. Yeah. And, and we're going to elaborate in the next video about what are the near long-term economic and market implications of this most likely outcome, which currently looks like a democratic sweep. And, you know, none of those outcomes suggest you should sell all your stocks today. Right. Yeah. I think, yeah, logically, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of information we still need to look at and a, a complete blue sweep is not a terrible thing for the stock market. Right.